Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us again for the latest in our continuing education series. Uh, this is automatic fire alarm for the public safety telecommunicator. My name is Lee Santel. I'm with the Rockland County Sheriff's Office here in downstate New York. Uh, Rockland County is actually the smallest county in New York State outside of the five boroughs of New York City, but we're pretty well populated. We have a population of about 325,000, and our semi consolidated countywide PSAP. Uh, in 2020, answered about 256,000 uh, calls coming in, about 100,000 of which were 911 calls, and the remainder were uh, seven digit or administrative phone calls. Uh, 2020 was a kind of an unusual year for us in terms of call volume. We typically, it's typically the other way around. Typically, we take a few more 911 calls and a few less uh, seven digit calls. So there's my contact information up there on the screen. As I say every time I do one of these webinars, I hope you'll take the opportunity if you're so inclined, if you have questions, comments, concerns, feedback, corrections, anything else like that, please don't hesitate to reach out by phone or email. There's my email address up there on the screen. And um, we are getting ready to start up our in-person training within the next probably month or two. Uh, we had suspended our dispatch training academy for the coronavirus pandemic, but since it seems to be evading a little bit, hopefully we'll be able to start that again soon. So we always post our in-person training opportunities to Facebook first. You can see our Facebook page there. Uh, the handle is 44 Control. So if you're not following us on Facebook, please give us a click. And and uh, if uh, if it's one of the trainings, there are a few that we keep internally just because of regulatory reasons. But for the ones that we are able to open up to everybody, I hope you will consider joining us. Uh, some legal fine print because the lawyers make me mention it. Again, this uh, webinar is for informational purposes only, and although I'm presenting in conjunction with the training committee of the Atlantic chapter of APCO, I don't re represent officially the Atlantic chapter when I'm giving these presentations, nor do I represent APCO International. Uh, so uh, you should always follow your local uh, policies, procedures, laws, regulations, and anything else like that you have at your agency. Um, speaking of APCO, uh, the quick commercial, as I always do one before we get started on these webinars, you probably found out about this presentation through uh, the Atlantic chapter of APCO on PS Connect or one of the other methods that APCO Atlantic chapter uses to reach out to uh, its mem to APCO members. But just in case you're not an APCO member, I hope you'll consider after the webinar is over becoming an APCO member. Um, becoming an APCO member, when, when you join APCO International, you automatically become a member of your local chapter. And if you're in one of the states of the Atlantic chapter, then that would be the one you would get enrolled with. But either way, when you join APCO and by extension, your local chapter, you get so many benefits. Uh, training, advocacy, networking, volunteer opportunities, career opportunities, uh, you know, uh, conferences, uh, both at the chapter and national level and all kinds of benefits. Uh, so if you're not a member of APCO already, I hope you consider becoming one. It's not expensive. It's very fast to sign up. It only costs about $7 a month. Um, and it's super easy to sign up after the webinar is over. Just go to the website, www.apcointl.org slash join. You just put in your information and your credit card, uh, stuff like that. It only takes about five minutes and then you'll be a member. I hope you'll consider it and thus end the, the commercial. So let's get into the content. We're gonna talk about automatic fire alarms today. And I think a lot of uh, PSAPs or ECCs, whatever we're calling them these days, a lot of agencies are receiving calls for automatic fire alarms. Obviously, if you work for a fire-based dispatch agency or if you're an agency that does a lot of fire dispatch, then of course you're gonna get a lot of these alarms. But even if you're not, if you're working for a, say a law enforcement agency and you're doing law enforcement dispatch, there's a good chance you're getting these alarms also Either um, you're going to pass the information on to the fire department. Uh, maybe you work for a law enforcement agency that also dispatches the fire department. We're one of those agencies. Uh, or maybe you dispatch law enforcement officers to the scene of alarms when they come in along with the fire department, which we do as well. Uh, so either way, I think that most or at least a good percentage of the of the PSAPs or, or the agencies in the country are, are dealing with some sort of uh, call volume regarding automatic fire alarms. So we're going to talk about uh, different kinds of automatic fire alarms, and some things that might be helpful for you to know when you're receiving these calls, especially if you're going to be receiving calls from either a central station or from the public who's reporting a fire alarm sounding. So we'll talk about several different kinds of automatic fire alarm detectors, smoke detectors, heat detectors, and that sort of thing. We'll also talk about some of the automatic flood systems out there. Some of the commercial and industrial sites that you may have in your district, um, they may have 
systems that are designed to suppress or extinguish fires when they start due to a high risk. Um, they flood the, the area with gas or foam. We'll talk about that. And we'll also talk a little bit about sprinkler systems, which is another kind of uh, notification for alarms that you might get in your center where they're calling up to report that the sprinklers have gone off, which is uh, related to the fire department response. So, so let's get into it. First, let's just talk about what happens when, when fire alarm systems get activated. Um, there's a couple different ways that those, those uh, notifications, that those signals can be sent over to the agency that's going to be doing a fire and or law enforcement dispatch. Um, one kind of system that we see is the idea of local signaling. And a local signaling system, um, basically the notification about the fire alarm does, going off either doesn't happen or it doesn't leave the premises. Uh, certainly for like, um, you know, the, the smoke detector you buy at Walmart or whatever, uh, if you have in your house or maybe you have in your small, your small office, your small business, uh, if they're not tied to any kind of notification system, then they're just going to make the, the siren go off or the beeper go off locally. Um, they don't actually telephone an alarm company. They don't actually notify a fire department or anything else like that. Um, some businesses do have local signaling systems which are connected to somebody, but the person that they're connected to is someone who's actually at the site. So, for example, um, you know, like a security booth or the front uh, reception desk or something like that, where it does make a notification, but the notification doesn't leave the building. It just goes to the to the local uh, staff that's monitoring the, the panel or the fire alarm system and gets notified. But then that staff, that security officer or 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 uh, staff member or whatever, is responsible for uh, calling the fire department or or doing whatever else needs to be done when the fire alarm goes off. Uh, and that we have that, for example, in our in our area, we have a number of sites like that where, um, you know, where we might get the call from somebody at the security desk or at the you know the front desk or whatever, saying, hey, you know, we've got a fire alarm. Can you please send the fire department? So that would be a, an example of a local signaling system. Then we have a remote station signaling system. Um, this is a situation where the fire alarm is connected directly to your agency, directly to your ECC. Uh, this is used to be something that was much more common in quote unquote the old days. Um, today, a lot of agencies, a lot of police fire uh, agencies have given up on direct monitoring of, uh, of signals from alarm panels. Um, if your agency does, and there are some that do, um, we actually, this is a bread and butter for us. We, uh, local county law, the county law here in Rockland County requires that all commercial facilities within the county of Rockland be direct connected to us. And we actually monitor the, the, the systems for, uh, for fire signals and trouble signals um, instead of it going to an alarm company like ADT or whoever. Uh, for commercial properties only. Residential properties, there's no restriction, but, but for commercial properties, it has to be uh, tied directly to us here in Rockland. And there are some other agencies do that. I know there's, a, uh, there, there's some out there in, like in uh, the Illinois and Chicago area and things like that that I've seen where they do the same. So there are some out there besides us, um, not as many as there used to be. I think it's fair to say that most agencies they're getting calls from an alarm company like ADT or Slomans uh, or, you know, whichever one of the other ones. And that's how they're getting notified when alarms go off. The alarm is not directly connected, does not directly dial in to the, to the ADC uh, right, right straight off. It goes to a central station. Uh, but if your agency has, some agencies have this where ordinarily they would not receive direct station signal. They would not receive remote station signaling. It would go to an alarm company, but they may monitor their own properties. For example, our neighboring county over in Westchester, um, the fire dispatch center over there, uh, they monitor the county properties that are on the county campus there. That is directly connected, and that's something that they do receive directly. But if it's anything else, businesses, residential that are outside of the county property, uh, then it's something that goes through a central station. And speaking of central stations, that's the kind that I think most telecommunicators are familiar with. That's where you have a private monitoring center that's monitoring the signals. Usually this is a third party company like ADT, Slowman's, um, you know, Front Point or, or whoever, where, um, where the signal is transmitted to a private company that has its own what they call a central station, which is basically like a, like a dispatch center that, that monitors what's going on with their customers' accounts. And if they receive a signal, then they're going to contact your agency and say, hey, you know, 911, this is, uh, you know, Slowman's, and we have a fire alarm going off at 123 Main Street. Uh, they're probably going to do that by phone. If you're lucky enough that your center has implemented the new ASAP to the PSAP technology, which is kind of a whole uh, separate presentation all to itself, which I'm probably going to have to work on 
Uh, but um, if your center is lucky enough to have that ASAP to the PSAP technology, then it's directly connected to your servers. And basically, uh, when, when alarms get sent to ADT or whomever, then they can just zip it right right into your computer and it comes up in your CAD system automatically, which which obviously is very nice. Uh, but not, not I think not everybody has that yet. So these are the three ways in which systems can transmit to the center. And obviously, you know, which one your center comes in contact with is going to depend on the exact circumstances that are going on to your agency. But again, I think a lot, I think most places are getting the phone calls from central stations, both for fire and burglar, burglary alarms as well. Um, again, unless you're lucky enough to have ASAP or you're, uh, you're monitoring the system directly on a panel at your center. So when they call up or when you're getting the signal, either way, when, they, when they're sending over a signal about a fire alarm detector going off, when there's a detection of a, of a potential fire condition at a premises, how does the system, how do the systems determine that there might be a fire? Well, there's a bunch of different sensors, basically, that they'll attach to the system. And those sensors uh, are designed to detect fire or other hazardous conditions that may occur in, in a variety of different ways. Um, and then when they trip, um, they, the sensor sends a signal to the alarm system and then the alarm system uh, either calls, either connects to your agency or it connects to a central station and it sends a signal saying, you know, fire, 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 and then somebody has to pick up the, the signal and, and decide what to do with it, call the fire department, call the, the PSAP uh, or, or, or whatever else needs to be done. So these are the various kinds of detection types that we typically see in some of these systems and um, we'll, we'll take, I'm not going to cover pull boxes because I think that one's fairly self-explanatory, but, but other than that, we'll, we'll take a quick look. So the first one we'll talk about is heat detectors. So a heat detector doesn't detect smoke. A heat detector uh, detects changes in the temperature in a room, in a, in a confined space, not a confined space, but in a closed space. So heat detectors, um, really it depends on how the alarm company sets it up. Some of them only alert. They'll just dial into the central station or the PSAP and let them know, hey, there is a heat change. Others are tied to suppression systems uh, where, where if the heat detector goes off, it automatically activates a fire extinguishing system or something like that. That really depends on um, how the alarm company set it up when they installed it. One thing to keep in mind about heat detectors is that they're really slow to function. They take forever, it's seemingly forever, to activate. So typically heat detectors are used not for life safety situation. We would not typically see, again, this is gonna depend on the local fire code and the local, you know, whatever. Um, but most commonly we don't see heat detectors as sort of the primary method of detecting a fire within a building, within a, within a residence or a commercial building. It's something that would either be used as an alternative or a backup. So for example, in a, in a home, um, they might have smoke detectors throughout the residence which is good, they should have one in every bedroom and one on each floor um, in addition. But, but then what sometimes what they'll do is they'll put a heat detector in the kitchen area instead to avoid the possibility or at least reduce the possibility of false alarms due to smoke. Um, you still have smoke detectors on the same floor where the kitchen is. You still have smoke detectors in rooms that may be near the kitchen, but, but in the kitchen itself, because you know oftentimes cooking causes a smoky or steam, things like that, um, then they typically will put a heat detector in there just to sort of act as a, um, like a backup or, or an auxiliary unit to the smoke detectors because they are so slow to function. It's not something that we would just say, well, this building just has heat detectors and that's it. Uh, that's not something we would typically see. They are pretty cheap. Uh, they're a relatively simple technology. Um, they do have a low rate of false alarm because, as I said, it's pretty hard to trip them. They take a long time to get to the point I mean, if the room is getting to the point where it's, you know, nearing 200 degrees or whatever, the, whatever temperature the heat detector is set to, um, you know, typically that means the fire is very well developed uh, if there is one. So um, it, it's a low rate of false alarms, but they also take a, a super long time to activate. We actually have two different kinds of heat detectors out there. We have what we call the rate of rise detector and the fixed temperature detector. And the difference is how they decide whether they should go off or not. The first one we'll talk about is the rate of rise detector. A rate of rise detector doesn't rely on the temperature in the room. Uh, typically, the way a rate of rise detector works is it monitors changes 
in the temperature in the room. So basically it, it checks the, the uh, either the amount, in other words, it, you know, it was at X, but now it's at Y. If that change, if that Delta is more than, you know, 50 degrees or whatever the number's set to, um, then the detector sounds. It also, some of them also uh, may ch check on the speed of the temperature change. So if the temperature goes up more than, you know, 20 degrees in less than 10 minutes or whatever, whatever they set it to, Again, that's something that the the alarm company will will uh, the alarm installer will will decide. Um, but if the speed is tripped in a certain you know if the speed build if the temperature builds with a fast enough speed, then then the detector will sound. Heat detectors that use rate of rise are typically better for detecting fires that are not as hot, like smoldering fires, like a cigarette in furniture or something like an electrical within within the wall. Um, because those types of fires typically uh, generate more heat than anything else. Um, they, they typically generate less smoke, at least in the early stages, and they generate less flame in the early stages. So it, it's sort of the heat that builds up in the room, and, and that's where a rate of rise detector might be useful. Um, again, there's no perfect detector that does it all, um, but that is one situation where they might want to check out the rate of rise. The, the other way of doing it is what we call the fixed temperature uh, heat detector, which is very simple. When the temperature in the room hits a certain magic number, the detector goes off. Um, usually, again, this is going to vary greatly depending on local code and, and the alarm company installer and things like that. Uh, but uh, usually that temperature is set to about 135 or 136 degrees. Some are set a little lower depending on if there's local code requirements or, or something like that, but, but usually it's 136 degrees. So basically when the temperature in the room hits the magic number of 136 or whatever it's set to, then the detector trips and sends a signal to, to the alarm system. Many heat detectors work on both. They contain both the fixed temperature sensor and the rate of rise uh, sensor. Uh, and then, you know, the detector may require both to trip before it decides to send an alarm, uh, or it may rely only on one or, or whatever the condition may be. Those are heat detectors. So the more common one we would, you know, kind of be accustomed to, especially in the residential environment, is the idea of a smoke detector. And again, some smoke detectors do have heat detectors in them and, and things like that, but it really all depends on which one you buy and, you know, what uh, what, what you pay for or whatever. But um, the thing about smoke detectors and why they're so important, you know, we always hear these classes and these training from the fire departments and, and, and such that, you know, the smoke detector is the most important one. Why is that? Well, first of all, it's important to remember, if you're not familiar with it because you don't have a fire background, it's important to understand that, that when people die in fires, at least in the United States, um, when they die in fires, especially residential fires, um, the majority of those deaths are caused by the smoke and other hazardous gases that are a result of the combustion. There are some people who do, for lack of a better term, burn to death in the building. That does obviously, it, you know, it, unfortunately it is a thing, but the majority, the vast majority of the fire deaths that occur when people die inside building fires and other fires, they typically die from, the, from breathing trouble associated with breathing in the smoke, the hot gases, the hazardous gases, and things like that. Uh, so for that reason, that's one reason why a smoke detector is so critical in, especially in a residential environment, but also in a commercial environment. Smoke detector is so critical to alert residents to smoke conditions. We're going to watch a video a little later on that will demonstrate it, but um, you know, sometimes the smoke is really the part that's very dangerous, even before the fire is very, very big, even before the fire becomes something where people say, oh, oh God, there's a fire, you know, let's get out. The smoke can actually be the more dangerous part long before the fire overtakes the, the room that you're in. So the smoke detector is super important when it comes to early warning um, of, of a fire or smoke condition, I should say. And then that's sort of the other side of the coin. Smoke detectors often provide the earliest warning. If you're in a house and you're on the second floor in the back bedroom and there's a fire on the first floor, the fire will not get to your room for some time, um, but the smoke will. The smoke pours through and filters through. And for that reason, smoke detectors typically provide the earliest warning of when there's a fire somewhere in the building. Even if it's not a big fire or even if it's not a fire that's close to you, Smoke detectors probably often give you the the earliest notification that a fire is occurring. So they they are <coughs> excuse me they are typically considered to be, if not the most critical, a very critical part of any fire detection system. There's two kinds of smoke detectors that actually more than two types, but the big two that we typically see are the ionization type and the photoelectric type. 
photoelectric eye type. The ionization type is the most common one. Um, these, these detectors actually have inside them, inside the, the case of the smoke detector, there's a small, small, tiny bit of radioactive element. Um, it's actually radioactive and it emits radioactive particles, um, the, the ions. And basically, kind of like an electric eye, but instead of using light, uh, the, the stuff that's coming out of the transmitter is radioactive ions. And those radioactives are detected by a sensor. When smoke enters the chamber, the ions, excuse me, when smoke enters the chamber, the smoke blocks the ion flow and the detector is tripped. And that's, that's how ionization detectors work. Um, typically, ionization sensors are most commonly used for spot coverage. And when I say spot coverage, I mean, coverage in an area where you really want to know if there's a fire starting in that particular area or that particular room. They may be tied to other detectors to trip them all, what we call a line, a, a line detection, but they're most commonly used for spot coverage. They're very fast reacting. The sensor uh, with the ions emitting from the radioactive material is, is very sensitive and it's fast reacting. So even if the fire is small, even if there's not that much smoke, the ionization detector can usually catch it pretty quickly. And also because the ion, the, the ions, it's using ion, radioactive ions to detect the, 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 the fumes, the smoke, um, it doesn't rely on light. It relies on these sort of radioactive ions. Um, sometimes that the smoke detector, the ionization smoke detectors can detect certain components of smoke uh, and hazardous gases that other detectors might not find out about it until it's too late. They, they tend to go off very early even when the human nose is not able to sort of really pick up the smell of smoke and things like that, or, or the, the gas is caused by combustion. So they go off super quickly and that's great to give you, you know, to give the, the occupants of the building a chance to evacuate before it's too late. Um, of course, the downside to ionization smoke detectors, because they're super sensitive, they're super prone to false alarms, steam, uh, dust, you know, anything that's in the air that can get in the way of that ion transmission, that ion uh, sensor can really cause these things to go off. So they can be annoying sometimes in the fact that they go off with way too many false alarms. They're also prone to static electricity. Um, if there's like a lightning storm outside or something like that, and there's a big, uh, you know, clap of thunder, it can make a lot of the fire alarms go off in the area if it's a super strong uh, local lightning um, because the static electricity also trips the detector um, and, and, and causes the fire alarm to go off. Uh, that being said, they are probably the most common that, that, uh, that we would see out there, especially in a residential environment. The other kind is the photoelectric one. And, and this is one where it's the same idea. It passes a stream of, of energy to a sensor, but in this case, it uses a light beam. It uses like an LED or something like that uh, to detect when there's visible smoke, when the smoke enters the chamber and, and, and gets in the way of the light beam and then the detector goes off. Unlike the ionization ones, these actually rely on the physical blocking of light coming out of the, the light, the, the, the LED. Um, so they typically can't detect these invisible gases and things like that. And, you know, that being said, they are pretty sensitive and they're still prone to false alarms from steam and dust and all the other stuff. They're not quite as sensitive to the static electricity, but certainly steam and dust and dirt in the air and things like that. If you're in like a bathroom or a basement or something like that or, or, or a kitchen and you can get a false alarm from these sorts of detectors. Some smoke alarm detectors have both ionization and photoelectric. And again, they may use a combination of signals or things like that. Um, and again, just like the ionization detectors, you might have this in a spot area where you wanna have it in one particular area where you're worried about a fire starting like a bedroom or an industrial spot. Um, or it might be what they call a line use where it's a generic uh, detector in like a hallway and things like that. And it, when it goes off, it trips all the fire alarms in the building. I'm going to show a quick uh, video from a local news report about the difference between uh, photoelectric detectors and ionization uh, smoke detectors. Let's just uh, take a quick look at that. We all have smoke alarms in our home. Uh, we go to the store, grab one off the shelf, put in a battery and install it. But paying attention to the type you use can make a big difference in how quickly your family is alerted to a fire. WCCO's Jennifer Merrily put smoke alarms to the test, and what she found prompted a Minnesota fire marshal to change what he has in his own home. Smoke alarms are by far the most effective way to get your family out safely when there's a fire. 
Still, statistics show one out of every four people who die in a house fire die when there's a working smoke alarm in the home. If it starts getting smoke in here, just put this mask on. So we went to one of the leading experts in Minnesota, Jamie Novak, to put them to the test. There are three types you can buy. This is the ionization smoke detector. This is normally the one that most people have in their house because they're the most inexpensive. Ionization tend to detect open flaming fires faster and photoelectric tend to detect slow smoldering fires faster. There's also a dual sensor which incorporates both technologies. With the help of Coon Rapids Fire Marshal Todd Williams, Novak mounted the three types to the ceiling of a Coon Rapids home. We first set a smoldering fire. Now we'll simulate somebody falling asleep, dropping a cigarette in here. A smoldering fire smokes for a long time before it turns to flames, if it ever does. The majority of people who die in a fire die from breathing in too much smoke, not the fire itself. A lot of the slow smoldering fires tend to be at night when you're asleep and not going to react. A slow smoldering fire during the day isn't that big and dangerous because you should notice the smoke and have plenty of time to get out. The dual sensor is the first to sound, 32 minutes and 40 seconds after the smoldering fire started. 10 seconds later, the photoelectric starts to blare. You can still see clearly through the room. Another 15 minutes go by, and the smoke started to irritate my lungs. And it's starting to bother my eyes, so it's time to put the mask on. This will help me with my breathing. As time ticks by, the ionization smoke alarm still hasn't sounded. It becomes harder to see through the smoke. Novak eventually needs to put on a mask, and Williams decides it's time to retreat. Definitely want to get out of this room. So if I would wake up without a smoke detector and sit up in this smoke condition, it would really be tough. Then you factor in the sleeping and darkness. It would be scary at this point to get out of your house. Nearly an hour after the photoelectric and the combination smoke alarm sounded, the ionization smoke alarm finally went off. I truly am surprised at the big difference between the two. So how do the smoke alarms fare in a flaming fire? We're going to show you. This is your kitchen fire or children playing with matches. All three types went off within three and a half minutes of each other. What's important to note is during our test, we could still get out safely when all of the smoke alarms sounded. Do you think if more people had photoelectric smoke detectors in their home, more lives could be saved? I think so. I think on some of the slow smoldering fires, that might be a big difference that make the difference between being alive or dead after a fire. All right, you saw Todd Williams leave the room because of the smoke. After our test, he changed the smoke alarms in his home. Williams is a husband and father. He's also the fire marshal in Coon Rapids and a 26-year veteran of the fire industry. He was part of the 90% of the population who only had ionization smoke alarms in their homes. He decided to place them with the dual sensor alarms. So you're probably wondering, how do I find out what kind of smoke alarm I have? Well, you look on the back of it and the fine print should say ionization or photoelectric. And Frank, in a store, the front of the packaging should have it clearly labeled. For example, here it has a P for photoelectric. Yeah, hard to see on TV, but it's easy to see to the naked sure. eye. Uh, this is a real eye opener. I, I have to imagine there's got to be a price difference between these two then, right? There is. The most common kind, the ionization that most people have in their homes is a lot cheaper. It's five to ten bucks. The photoelectric is 20 and up, and the dual sensor is about 30 plus, and it could run you even more if they're hardwired in your home. Mm -hmm. The one thing that we want to stress is any working smoke detector is better than nothing. Sure. And there's a dramatic difference then you showed us too as there well. There is a dramatic difference yeah. between them. Okay, so yeah, so I mean, there is a difference between the smoke detectors and, and uh, again, some people get upset because of the false alarms or, or whatever, but, um, but it is what it is. Let's move on to gas detectors. Um, I think the one we're, we're most, probably most uh, commonly familiar with is the idea of the carbon monoxide detector. And uh, there are ones for natural gas, but, but they're not as common. The one that's most common is, in, in, at least in my experience, is the detector for carbon monoxide, which is colorless and odorless and, um, you know, can make you very sick or kill. Uh, some, uh, many municipalities, many local areas have started to require that inhabited buildings have carbon monoxide detectors, uh, working carbon monoxide detectors in the home, um, or they need to be replaced every certain number of years and things like that. Um, so that, that's something that's going to depend, again, on your local fire code and things like that. Regarding the, the tripping of the carbon monoxide uh, alarm, 
you know, sometimes uh, they, they have those carbon oxide alarms like we saw on the previous page where it has the little digital display on the front and it shows the level of the, the parts per million that it detects in the air at any given time. Uh, that is not necessarily a good indication of whether it's safe to be in the building or not. So sometimes we will get calls from people and they say, oh, you know, uh, my carbon oxide detector is beeping and it shows like two or something, you know, and, and don't get fooled and say, well, two, you know, two PPM, that's not really a lot, you know, so what's the big deal? We don't have to send anybody. It is not necessarily a safe indicator. It's a convenience for the people who are either testing or for the fire department uh, to come and look at it. But the bottom line is if the detector is beeping, um, there's a chance that it's not safe to be in the residence or not safe to be in the building. So, you know, we should have them evacuate and send the appropriate response. And again, for most areas, that's usually the fire department. Even if you're going to tell the, the caller to go outside, if you get, even if you can tell them to evacuate the building, remember, just because you move a caller, a, a victim to fresh air does not necessarily mean that they are permanently safe and that's all you have to do. Carbon monoxide is one of those things that can build up in your bloodstream. Um, it can even build up very slowly in your bloodstream. And once you have that carbon monoxide on board, your body is not going to function the way it's supposed to if it's quite a bit of carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide interferes with the way your blood cells are able to absorb oxygen. Um, and you need to have treatment at a hospital to get rid of that carbon monoxide. It's not something where, you know, it's not like where you can just go outside to fresh air and stay out for an hour and then you'll be fine and go on with your life. I mean, you might, but um, it, it's something where fresh air alone may not be enough to ensure that the person is going to be healthy and safe long term. So just telling a caller to just, you know, go outside and and don't worry about it and, and get it checked later by their plumber or whatever is not necessarily sufficient. It's going to depend on your local agency's procedure, but um, the you know response of the fire department or another emergency service agency uh, in many cases is going to be appropriate in order to make sure that everybody is healthy and safe and to make sure, especially since, you know, especially if the person's going to go back and going to want to go back into their home or whatever. Um, so, so just telling them to step outside and, and, and you know, come back later or whatever is not really a, a, a sufficient resolution for it, regardless of the amount of carbon monoxide involved, even if it's a small amount. Uh, and again, that, that level of carbon monoxide could fluctuate in the residence or the building, depending on what's going on. Typically, the carbon monoxide is created, uh, not always, but in many cases, created by incomplete combustion by the furnace. So that means that when the furnace is on, uh, then the carbon monoxide is going to be much higher. And when the furnace is off, the carbon monoxide may be lower. Um, so, you know, telling the person to go outside and then, you know, we'll just get to it when we get to it and they can come back in after they've had some fresh air or telling them to open a window and they don't have to uh, leave um, or, or something like that. Um, you know, we want them to leave the building and leave until a, an emergency professional is able to check out and make sure that everybody's safe make sure that it's safe to be in the building and things like that because it, it might come back to bite them later. So we can't just tell them to open a window and never mind. Uh, they have to leave the building and, and we're probably going to need an emergency response on that. Again, follow your local procedure. Next, we're going to move on to flame detectors. Flame detectors are something that we typically see only in a commercial environment. I guess there might be some residential environments that use flame detectors. Uh, but they're not that common. Flame detector is used in a situation where you have an area or a room and there's a risk of a fire starting and if the fire starts uh, it's extremely dangerous the fire could like explode or grow very rapidly you know if you have somebody who's working in a factory or in a commercial environment on something that's super flammable or there's like a super flammable uh, you know like tanks of chemicals or something like that um, <clears throat> excuse me when there's like an extreme flammability risk for that particular area because they're working with something that's very sensitive or very flammable uh, and if there is a, even a small fire it'll rapidly grow out of control um, then they might use a flame detector a flame detector is designed i mean they're not cheap and they can be finicky but they're designed to point at one very small specific area and if there's even the slightest hint of a fire or a flame um, then, then they trip immediately and, and they go off very quickly, which is, which is sort of what they're designed for. There's a couple different kinds. The ultraviolet kind uh, is able, uses a special sensor that's able to detect the ultraviolet light, which is caused by fires, um, by certain fires, many fires. When the flames burn, they emit visible light to the naked eye, but they also emit ultraviolet light. Um, and, uh, and that ultraviolet light can be detected by, by the detector. Uh, and then it can it can trip. Now, other things, especially in a commercial environment, can cause ultraviolet light. Sunlight has some amount of ultraviolet light in it, 
So you'll see it, the, uh, the, the ultraviolet detector is going to have one of those little like uh, hoods or canopies over it to try and prevent uh, sunlight from getting in, you know, from accidentally tripping the detector erroneously from a shaft, of, from a beam of sunlight or whatever. Uh, welding is another one that can cause uh, ultraviolet light. And obviously in a in sort of industrial environment, a commercial environment, that's something that could very much be a thing. Someone could be welding. Uh, so, you know, you, they do require a little bit of care in how you place them and how you use them so you don't get erroneous false alarms. Uh, of course, you know, it has like a glass cover on the front of the sensor. Um, and if there's dust or moisture, then the, the beam that it uses to detect uh, the ultraviolet light can, can be occluded. Uh, so, you know, again, a lot of the times these sensors are like in a commercial environment. So, uh, you know, if that's the case, you got to make sure that you keep it clean so that they're not accidentally tripping due to the dust, moisture, and, and things like that that you might see in an industrial type environment. The other kind is the infrared detector. They don't detect the ultraviolet light. Um, they detect the infrared light, which emits from the flames. Again, it's possible to get a false trip on these detectors from things like sunlight. They also have a fairly limited distance range, so they really have to be sort of close up, real close, like within, say, a few feet of the affected area, and they can only cover a small area. They're really super spot sensitive, um, but they are very, very good for really fast spreading fires. If you have an industrial environment where someone is working with like a very flammable substance or a very, you know, dangerous sort of situation. And if there's any kind of spark or flame, it's really just going to say, whoosh, it's just going to go up real fast. Um, the, the infrared detectors can do a quick reaction to that. And especially if you're going to combine it with like a suppression system, you're going to tie a fire extinguishing system to it. And that way, if the infrared sensor goes off, it really, it floods the whole area, which we'll talk about in a minute. It suppresses the fire to keep it from spreading or to give people a chance to evacuate and things like that. We do sometimes see where they have a combination of both the ultra light, the ultraviolet, I'm sorry, I have a typo on that, a uh, combination of the ultraviolet light and infrared sensors in one detector. Um, and then the way they do that is it doesn't trip the alarm unless both the ultraviolet and the infrared sensors go off. Uh, and then it, it, if both are activated, then it trips the alarm in order to reduce the possibility of a false alarm. So that's something you might see like in a commercial or industrial environment. Suppression systems. Uh, these are systems that are typically tied to um, either they can activate independently, but they might also be tied to an alarm system. So they might activate by themselves and try to put out a fire. They might be tied to the alarm system so that if the alarm system goes off, then the suppression system also automatically goes off or vice versa. If the suppression system goes off, then it trips the alarm at the same time. It really depends on the exact circumstances at the site and, and how they've set it up and everything else. The most common one we think about when it comes to suppression systems is the idea of a fire sprinkler system. And basically, it's just a system that's designed to automatically spray water on a fire. They're typically found in commercial buildings because commercial buildings, as a rule, depending on what kind of building it is, what you know, what's inside, if it's industrial, if it has hazmat or things like that, um, sprinkler systems are most commonly found in commercial buildings because of the higher risk. But they're almost they're, they're also found mostly in commercial buildings because businesses are willing to pay the added expense for having. Uh, the, the, the sprinkler system installed, or it may be required by code. Ironically, most building fires don't occur in commercial facilities. I mean, I think we, I think we tend to assume that a fire in a commercial building is usually worse, usually because of hazmat or things like that. Um, but the truth is, on a national basis, most building fires that do occur, occur in residential buildings, not commercial buildings. So for that reason, even though we find most sprinkler systems in commercial buildings, the fire service nationwide is really trying to urge homeowners to install fire sprinklers in their home um, because they're super important to protect lives and to some extent property uh, because most fires, most building fires occur in residential buildings, not commercial buildings. And unfortunately, uh, in many areas, or I, I, I'm inclined to say maybe even most areas, local code does not require sprinklers to be installed in residential buildings there may be exceptions for like multifamily buildings or something like that or apartment buildings but especially for, you know certainly for single family dwellings for for detached family dwellings um you know i don't i think most building codes don't require it which is a shame um especially if you're building new construction it's not that much more expensive to install a fire sprinkler system in new construction i i, I could understand if you have an existing house and to rip it out and start putting in all kinds of pipes and everything, that, that, that's one thing. 
Um, but certainly if it's new construction, it doesn't add that much to the cost of the building. And it's, it's really becoming an important thing to have sprinklers in the home. And, and, and they, they really do a, an important job when, when building fires do occur. I think one misconception about sprinkler systems in general, whether we're talking about commercial or residential, is that sprinkler systems are designed to protect, first of all, lives. They're not designed to really protect property. Yes, uh, having a sprinkler system can prevent a fire from spreading out of control and burning down your whole house. They can sort of confine the fire to the room that was that it was in the fire room. Um, but that's not necessarily what they were designed for. They're designed to protect lives. They don't in many cases, put out the fire. And if you watch these sprinkler you know, demonstration videos or even the real ones, if you get the chance to watch one, and there are plenty on the internet, we'll watch one of them, if I'm not mistaken, during this presentation. But you'll notice that you say, well, you know, it's weird, the sprinkler's on and that's great, but it's not putting out the fire. You know, the fire is still there. What's the point of the sprinkler? It's not gonna put out the fire. The, fire, the sprinkler is not designed, not typically anyway, to totally put out the fire. Um, there may be some sprinkler systems that are designed for that, but especially in a residential environment, most are not designed to put out the fire. The point of a sprinkler system is to protect lives by tamping down the fire and tamping down the heat that occurs and tamping down the fumes that occur in a residential fire to give the, the building occupants an extra few minutes to get out with their lives instead of being trapped uh, by rapidly rising heat and smoke and everything else. So to say that the sprinklers are you know, going to put out the fire and that, that's not really what they're meant for. They're meant to sort of tamp or control the fire and to, to, just to give the people in the building a chance to evacuate with, and not get killed. Um, and sprinklers are not always effective for slow burning fires. You know, we saw that video before with the smoke detectors where they have the little, you know, the little uh, couch, the love seat with the cigarette in it. I mean, the fire doesn't spread very rapidly. It's a slow smoldering fire. It's probably not going to trip the sprinkler system if there is one in the building. And even if it does somehow trip the sprinkler system, if it's burning that slow and it's sort of smoldering, the sprinkler system's not really gonna make a big difference as to whether that fire keeps smoldering or not. That's not really what they're designed for. The sprinklers may also not always be effective for what, you know, the big flash fires, like we said, in an industrial environment where it flashes up and it, you know, it's suddenly this huge, you know, fireball that flashes up and starts Sprinkler systems typically take a while to activate, and even when they do fully activate, they may not be able to supply enough water and enough volume to really put the fire out uh, or, or control it. So they're not necessarily a, um, you know, a, a, a full safe solution. Uh, it, it's something that depends on the circumstances and depends on how it goes. Sprinkler systems themselves, the sprinkler heads, I mean, it's a pretty simple device. It's just a water pipe that runs through the ceiling or on the wall and connected to the water pipe is a water sprayer. The sprayer has a heat sensitive part in there uh, and the heat sensitive part basically, I mean, basically to be honest in a simple sprinkler head, it's nothing more than a plug with wax. It's a wax plug that's put in the opening of the pipe uh, and the wax is com comprised with a certain chemical composition that uh, it's made to melt at a certain temperature. Uh, it's the same kind of wax they put in that little turkey baster thing you have in your turkey. It has a little wax in there that melts at a certain temperature. That temperature is usually 165 degrees, but it's going to depend on the exact sprinkler model and all that stuff. Uh, and when the heat rises high enough, then the, the, the wax or the other whatever wax, whatever they're using, the stuff melts, and that basically opens the pipe, and water begins to flow out. And you can see there's a wide variety of different styles of uh, – you know, sprinkler head, the conventional kind and the pendant kind are probably the most common. Basically, the pipe just sprays out onto a little screen that diffuses the water in all directions. They have the horizontal ones, uh, as you be the sidewall ones, which are made for being on, a, on, on the wall instead of the ceiling. Uh, we have the pendant ones, uh, which are made to be sort of implanted or, or embedded in the ceiling. The uh, concealed ones, you can see they have the little white caps that go over it. And basically, uh, when the sprinkler goes off, the cap just sort of uh, lowers down and falls away. Uh, it's just to, to keep you from having to see ugly sprinkler heads in the ceiling in a fine establishment uh, or, or whatever. Older sprinkler heads used to spray about half their water at the ceiling and half at the floor. Um, I'm not exactly sure why they used to do that, and I can't seem to find any literature on why that is. And I, I, I may be old, but I'm not quite that old yet, or at least that's what I'm telling myself. So I don't really know why. But I do know that the newer sprinkler heads, they just, I'm guessing it has something to do with cooling down the room or maybe preventing the fire from spreading upward through, you know, into the cockloft or whatever. But 
Either way, newer sprinkler heads typically direct all of their water to the floor, and that's going to result in a, in a nice flood onto the floor, which is, you know, I'm part of the downside of sprinklers. They can cause de property damage from, from the water flooding, but I guess that's better than dying in a fire, which is, you know, sort of the something we're trying to avoid here. Some newer sprinkler heads try to deal with the water damage situation by having the ability, a little more advanced technology. It's not just a wax plug that melts away and then the pipes open forever until you turn off the water. Some newer sprinkler heads have the ability to sort of open and close as needed, depending on the temperature change. So when the temperature in the room hits 165, the sprinkler open and water be and water begins sprinkler opens and water begins to flow. If the temperature, you know, if the sprinkler is successful and the temperature in the room begins to fall, once the temperature drops below 165, then the sprinkler head closes because we don't need that extra water coming out now. And that helps to at least try and prevent some of the water damage that can occur with the sprinkler head flooding out onto all the floor and everything. Um, and if the temperature goes up again, if the fire starts to flare up again and the temperature goes up again, the sprinkler head opens back up and, and it just sort of seesaws back and forth until the fire is, is eventually extinguished. Those are obviously more expensive and complicated, but they can help reduce at least some of the water damage associated with sprinklers. Another type of uh, difference we see in sprinkler systems is the idea of a wet sprinkler system versus a dry sprinkler system. So a wet pipe sprinkler system has water in the pipes at all times. Basically the water is all charged up in the pipes under pressure, it's ready to go. The water is basically right at the tip of the sprinkler head there. And if the, if, the, if, the, if the sprinkler opens, if the sprinkler is tripped, the water rushes right out, starts putting water on the fire right away. It, that's better than a dry pipe system where the dry pipe uh, system, there is no water in the pipe. The water is that the pipes that lead to the sprinklers are empty. And if the sprinkler head opens up, then the pressure is changed and the water comes rushing in from the source and, and things like that. So wet, dry, wet, uh, wet pipe sprinkler systems do provide water much more quickly in the event of an activation, but there's downsides to wet pipe systems because number one, you can't use them in areas where the pipes might freeze. If you have a sprinkler system that's outside or in a building where the temperature might get close to freezing or, or in a refrigerated area or a freezer area or something like that, then you can't have a wet pipe system because the pipes are going to freeze and, and you're going to end up with a horrible mess. Likewise, these sprinkler heads can sometimes leak and or burst, and then you have water spraying out all over the place. So sometimes wet wet sprinkler systems can be a real annoyance because they can cause bad water leaks. Uh, you know, if something goes wrong with the pipe. And then the other side is the other type is the dry pipe sprinkler system. So there's air in the pipe, and basically, if the sprinkler opens, then the water has to flow from wherever it comes in from the street, from the utility room, and it's got to make it up to the floor where you know you need the water. And then, and then the water comes out. Typically, that takes a little longer to activate. That can take several minutes for the water pressure to build, depending on you know, how it's constructed and how big the building is. That can take a few minutes for the water to sort of build up and get out to where the sprinkler is and get out on the fire. Um, so that's a downside. But you know, they're also much more complicated and expensive than wet pipe systems because you have to have it set the right way and all installed the right way. Um, but obviously, if you're going to have an area where the pipes might freeze, then you definitely need a dry pipe sprinkler system because otherwise, you know, the, the, the pipes are going to freeze and you're going to have all kinds of trouble. Um, a dry pipe system is usually more complex and expensive. So certainly not something we would typically see in a residential environment and in a commercial environment. Again, it depends on how much, you know, money they want to spend or, or, or whatever else. Obviously the risk of leaking is a little bit less with a dry pipe system because there's no water in the pipe. So if you have to replace a sprinkler head, you don't have to drain the whole system and all that jazz. You can just, you can just sort of replace the, the sprinkler head with the right precautions. It's a little easier, but but they're more complex and expensive to design and set up. Many sprinkler systems are tied to water flow detectors. And basically a water flow detector is a kind of a detector that's attached to the fire alarm system and it, it monitors the water pressure. And if there's a dip or a change in the water pressure, um, then the detector goes off. The idea is that if there's a dip in the water pressure, that probably means that the sprinkler has gone off. Uh, because now the sprinkler is flowing water and the water pressure dips. And if the sprinkler goes off, that means there's probably a fire, right? That's the whole idea of the sprinkler going off. So in that case, we should trip the fire alarm and send the fire department. So that's a good thing. But water flow detectors on sprinkler systems can also be tripped by uh, uh, mundane things. Like, for example, if you're doing plumbing work or sometimes when, uh, you know, the municipality, when you get the water coming in from the street and they have like a, a water main break or somebody hits the fire hydrant outside or something like that. Um, and then the water flow to the building drops and then the water flow sensor goes off erroneously. 
Uh, so it you know, burst pipe, things like that. So it is possible that a water flow sensor might send a false alarm. The most common one we see at our place is in a commercial facility where they accidentally, you know, they 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 accidentally shear off one of the sprinkler heads, or they they knock a sprinkler head, or they burst a pipe, and then and then you know the water flow detector goes off, and and then we end up sending the fire department. Let's take a quick look at some uh, demonstration of residential sprinkler systems. Uh, and you can really see how the uh, smoke becomes very thick and within a minute, uh, it really becomes impassable. I mean, anybody who's still in this in this room or in this area of the building is going to be in severe life threatening danger almost immediately. It's only been one minute and 12 seconds since the fire since the uh, smoke detector went off. So we can see that the, the sprinkler did not totally put out the fire. Um, it wasn't supposed to. It just prevents the fire from growing out of control like this and gives the occupants a, a few extra minutes to get out with their lives and avoid this sort of situation that we're seeing right here. Uh, sprinklers can also help the fire department by, uh, by giving the fire department the ability to get in a little more easily and help anyone who's in the building by, you know, by tamping down the fire, by tamping down the smoke, uh, and give firefighters a bit of an easier time to get into the building and make entry. Okay, so let's talk about hood suppression systems. So, uh, you know, the most common place we see hood suppression systems is one of two places, either at your local restaurant, uh, especially ones with, you know, open kitchens that are exposed to the dining room, uh, but also in closed kitchens as well, um, over the stovetop, over the over the range top. Uh, you also see these at the gas stations. You know, they have those canopies where the cars are getting the fuel pumps underneath, and then, you know, they have the, the extinguish the extinguisher system that can that can discharge if it detects a fire. The most common brand name that I'm familiar with is Ansel. There are other ones. Um, some of them do discharge water, uh, but most of them discharge a chemical powder or sometimes a liquid. The most common one is a powder in my experience. It depends on the exact application. Um, you, you probably have seen this at one point in your life where, you know, somebody, some gas station, the Ansel system goes off and it just, it blows powder, white powder all over everyone. Um, so, so these are not that uncommon, and and obviously, if again, if they go off, um, then it may trip the fire alarm as well. We also have flood systems. A flood system is a system that is designed to flood an entire room or an entire building with something to put out the fire. Again, like sprinklers, the point might not be to completely extinguish the fire, although they can. 
Um, but the real primary goal of these uh, flooding extinguishing systems is to sort of tamp down the fire or control the fire so that uh, people can get out without being killed and the fire department can get a head start on, on putting out the fire. There's two different kinds. We have our uh, foam ones and our gas ones. The foam ones discharge foam onto the floor. Typically, these are used in situations with like uh, fuel fires and things like that. Uh, the foam is designed to uh, either prevent the fire from starting or if there is a fuel fire in progress or some other fire in progress to um, to extinguish the fire as quickly as possible. Um, we're going to take a quick look at um, one of the biggest foam systems that I've ever seen, which is at uh, the, the, the hangars that NASA uses to, to work with aircraft. Today, we're going to test 4802, the high foam expansion uh, system. Today's test consists of the foam will mix with the water, it will go through the generators, and it will dissipate through the floor. It has to cover under the wing within 60 seconds, about 90%, and then it has to get up to three feet of the hangar in within four minutes. The high expansion foam system it would be for a fairly rare scenario, some sort of large fuel leak from an aircraft and uh, it igniting onto in fire. The test was a success. It was a pass. Uh, they hit the criteria for both of the time marks that we were looking for. Um, on that, we're still waiting for the readings on the foam concentrate levels. Uh, they will test the concentration of the foam to make sure that we had proper mixing. But it looks like based on the foam that that won't be a problem. So it was a successful test today. Yeah, and that's something that we would often see is something placed like a, an airport, a large industrial facility, a factory line, things like that, where they're working with fuel and other things where they might want to have the phone system discharged in the event of an emergency. And of course, if we have firefighters who are responding to that sort of uh, location, or if there's a suspicion that the phone, the phone system is deployed, then we definitely want to let the fire and other responders know, so that, because being in that area when the phone is discharging might be unsafe. Uh, it's, it's some of the stuff is, is you know, the, the, the chemicals they use are sometimes hazardous to make the foam. And of course, you know, somebody standing on the floor, they're getting covered by four or five feet of foam or, or whatever it is, is, is not exactly safe. We also see the idea of a flood system that uses gases. Um, basically, they smother the room with gas that's kept in compressed tanks. Um, and these gases help to tamp down or extinguish the fire in various ways. Now, there are a lot of different gases that they can use for this sort of thing. The one that they used to use was called Halon. Um, Halon is now not, longer, it's not allowed for new installations in the United States anymore because it has certain environmental impacts. Um, but there are definitely other ones that they use. Uh, there are what they call clean agents, uh, like FM200 and the others. They're called clean agents because they're not... Uh, they're not life-threatening to humans. Uh, they, if you're in the room when there's an FM200 system discharging, I mean, I would still recommend you evacuate. Uh, but um, but they're not, you know, they're not toxic like some of the other ones. There's inert gases like energen and things like that. Um, but the one that I think is very very common, which we see quite a bit in these systems, is carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is discharged from a tank into the room. The carbon dioxide helps to tamp or extinguish the fire without the use of water. And they would use these systems in a place where 
it would not be good to use water like you have expensive computer electronics or you have chemicals that don't mix well with water or cause further problems. So we'll use the gases instead. Carbon dioxide is one that's very commonly used. Carbon dioxide displaces oxygen. So by, uh, by affecting the amount of oxygen available to the fire, it helps the fire to go out or extinguishes the fire. Uh, the problem is carbon dioxide and some of these other chemicals that they use in these, in these extinguishing systems, um, they, they get rid of the oxygen. And that means if there's someone in the room, including firefighters or other responders, then they're going to be in deep trouble because, uh, because they won't be able to breathe oxygen. So whenever there is a flood system at the site uh, where the fire is you know, possibly happening, or certainly if the flood system has been detected, if, if it has activated and you're getting the sensor trip, uh, that the flood system has been going off or it's equipped with a flood system. We have to make sure that responders know that there's a flood system there and that it might have gone off because if it, if that is the situation, it, either they need to don a uh, breathing apparatus to go in uh, or they may not be able to go in at all without special precautions depending on the circumstances. And certainly we don't want them in there without special precautions and all of a sudden the, 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 the system trips and, and you know they're in trouble. Uh, so we want to make sure that we're letting the responders know ASAP if we have any inkling that there's one of these gas flooding systems, these gas uh, discharge systems uh, at the site where they're going to. I'm going to show a quick demonstration from one of the, um, the system manufacturers for these gas systems. This particular system is discharging carbon dioxide. I just want to, before I play the tape, it's a short tape, but I just wanted to mention it is very loud. So if you have the speaker turned all the way up, you might want to turn it down a little bit. Here we go. I'm just going to cut that off before we all go deaf or whatever. But again, if, if, if you saw that was a carbon dioxide system and you can see how there is a delay when the alarm goes off to make sure that at least give people a chance to evacuate the room because the system is about to discharge. But then once the system discharges, you can see it really does that, that, that push discharge at the, in the middle there where it really floods the whole room with the uh, gases. You can imagine if somebody was in there, whether a firefighter, other responder, a civilian, whatever, especially since that gas is carbon dioxide and it's going to make them virtually impossible to get the oxygen that they need. Plus, it's very difficult to see in that room. You can see it, it fogs up the whole room, makes it very hard to see. So uh, again, if, if you know that the site or if you're alerted that the site has one of these systems, it's very important to let the responders know as early as possible. And we also got to make sure that uh, we tell the caller and anybody else at the site to evacuate immediately in case it goes off. Okay, and then we're gonna talk about the control types. We have our fire alarm control panels and our fire enunciator panel. So the fire alarm control panel or FACP, that's the sort of the brain for the whole system. This is where the central computer and electronics are that make the fire alarm system go. And if you have a residential uh, system, you might have a very small little you know, panel where you can you know, turn the fire alarm on and off and things like that. Uh, of course, if it's a commercial facility like we see here, it could be a very large system with various sensors on different floors and, and all kinds of fancy things. But basically, all the detectors and sensors that are in the system are going to connect to this panel. And then if one of them goes off, then the panel is going to set off the, the, uh, the sirens or lights or whatever, you know, whatever the, the, the building has. And then it's also going to contact either the central station or the PSAP. Uh, or, or whatever, whatever it's programmed to do, depending on the local fire code and depending on, um, you know, how they set it up when they install the system and things like that. For the convenience of responders, they will typically have a small little panel right by the front door, right by the entrance called an enunciator panel. And the enunciator panel basically is just like a little remote control system for the fire alarm control panel. It just lets the fire department or whoever's coming in get a quick look right when they walk in the door 
of you know the status of the system, which detector is going off, what the area that is. They can silence the alarm. They can reset the alarm. Basically, like a little a little digital panel that lets them uh, you know see what's going on with the system and 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 you know change it or or turn it on and off and and things like that. So typically, when firefighters go to a site and they say we need to know where the panel location is. They might want to know where the main fire alarm control panel is, but usually the, their first stop is going to be the enunciator panel. And some agencies like ours are required to give that to the fire department when they respond, especially for a very large building or a large facility. Um, they might need to know where the enunciator panel is so that they can go over there right when they get there and, and, and see what's going on with the alarm system. They know what area of the building to check, which detectors are going off and, and, and things like that. Uh, lastly, regarding the kind of signals that we get, and again, this is something that, uh, you know, if you're getting your, your alert signals only from a central station, you might not get called by them unless it's a fire signal. Um, but if you're getting your signals directly, if it's connected directly to your agency, you're doing direct monitoring, then you might get some of the other ones. The most obvious one, of course, is fire. Uh, you know, either you're getting it directly on your panel or the central station is calling you and they're telling you, hey, you know, we're getting a a fire signal from the site, um, depending on how complex the system is, how fancy the system is, or how much money they've paid to have it installed, or how they have it set up. The, uh, the, when you get the call or the alert about the fire signal, they might be able to tell you the point or the zone, which is basically which area of the building or which sensor or detector is going off. Is it the first floor? Is it the second floor? Is it the smoke detector? Is it the heat detector? Is it in the bedroom? Is it in the basement? Uh, whatever the story is, um, but but uh, if it's a, a more basic or an older system, then a lot of them just show fire and then it'll tell you anything else. So then it's up to the fire department when they get there to see what's going on and where the signal is coming from and so forth and so on. Um, typically with most fire alarm systems, once it's activated, they don't turn off. The visual and audible devices are gonna go off until the system is silenced or reset. Um, some agencies tell callers to silence the alarms in, in certain circumstances, others don't. My personal opinion on this, which is not the same as what you should be doing, is that the devices should be sounding until somebody who's in charge, like the fire chief or whoever, is going to go over there and either silence or reset the alarm. Until then, they should go off to make sure that people know there's a fire alarm going off, to make sure they leave the building. Um, you know, and then when the fire department gets there, they can decide what they want to do in terms of silencing it or complete. Silencing means that it's still in fire mode, just the sirens stop going off. Uh, and then reset would be to sort of cancel the fire signal and return the, the system to normal operation. You might also get multiple points or zones coming in. Um, you know, multiple points or zones coming in, when you get the call from Slomans or whoever, and they call up and they say, oh, you know, or ADT or whoever, and they call up and they say, oh, we're getting signals from the second floor master bedroom and the guest bedroom and also from the bathroom or whatever. Um, you know, that could be indicating that there's a big fire in the house and it's setting off all the detectors and holy cow, let's get over there right away. Or it could be that there's some sort of malfunction, like a flooding condition or something like that. And then now all the detectors are being erroneously activated or, or something like that. So, uh, the, you know, if obviously if we, if we are told, or if we are somehow notified that there are multiple pointer zones going off, that we want to make sure we want to let the responders know so that they can check all the affected areas, every bedroom that's activated or whatever, make sure that there's no fire in there that they need to know about. Um, we want to make sure that they're aware that there's multiple points going off and what those points are, what those, zone, what those uh, zones are. And again, uh, you may not be getting some of these signals if you don't receive fire, fire alarm uh, signals directly, but if you do receive them directly, you might be monitoring trouble signal. The trouble signal basically is just the fire alarm control panel telling you um, that there was a malfunction in one of the components of the alarm system. The malfunction could be with one of the detectors. It could be with one of the alerting devices. It could be with the panel itself. It could be with the wiring. It could be with the backup battery that's attached to the system. Uh, they could also be sending you a signal to let you know that there's a problem with um, the connection that it uses. It typically dials over a phone line or uh, sometimes there's other methods, the internet, radio, things like that. Um, you know, some trouble, typically trouble signals are ones that, uh, you know, don't affect the entire system. You know, maybe one smoke detector is not working, but the rest of the system is operating normally. Uh, so it's calling to let you know that the alarm company or whoever's responsible for it has to come out and fix the problem so that that faulty detector or whatever is repaired. That's different from a supervisory trouble. You might hear alarm company, central station personnel talk about supervisory troubles. A supervisory trouble is a special kind of trouble signal 
And that's a trouble signal that happens when the fire alarm panel wants to let you know that there's a serious problem with the system. There is some sort of problem with the system that me- that is is serious enough that if there's a fire, then you know you might not be properly notified. So supervisor, you know, this would be like a situation where the phone lines are down or the backup battery's dead, or um, you know, there's the, the panel itself is fried and it's going to like a backup mode or something like that, or it has multiple panels and some of the panels aren't working or something like that. You know, if there's a supervisory trouble, that means that there's a serious problem with the system and someone needs to fix it right away, please. So that's what a supervisory trouble is. We also have a timer test. Typically, panels send a daily check-in signal to the central station or to you. They call that a timer test or a daily test. Typically happens every 24 or 25 hours. Um, it'll just sort of check in and just to make sure that everything's working normally, the phone lines are working and that the, the communication is occurring, the systems aren't down and whatever. Um, if a certain amount of time, typically 24 or 25 hours goes by, <clears throat> excuse me, and uh, the signal is not received, then you may get what they call a, a daily test failure or a timer test failure or late to test. It depends on, uh, it depends on how they set it up. But basically that means that uh, something might be wrong with the alarm system because it was expecting that daily test and it didn't get the daily test. So maybe somebody should go over to the site and check out to make sure that the alarm system is working properly and that there's power at the building and, and everything else. Um, and then we have our abnormal timer test. An abnormal timer test means that it's sent its daily check-in but typically what it does is a lot of these newer systems, what they do, they, they do a little internal diagnostic before they send their daily test and they send the results along. Uh, so so if, if it does its little internal test before it does its daily check-in and it finds out that there's a trouble with the system of some kind, it'll, it'll check in and say, hi, this is the 24 hour daily test. Um, but by the way, while I'm doing a daily test, there's something wrong with the system that needs to be repaired, please fix it. Uh, and typically they call that an abnormal timer test or an abnormal daily test. Uh, so that's an indication that, yes, it is working. Yes, it is communicating and the system is able to communicate and so forth. Um, then then, then you did get the check-in, but it's not working properly. Of course, if you don't get it at all, if you don't get the check-in at all within 24 or 25 hours or whatever it's set to, typically it's set to a 24-hour cycle or thereabouts, um, then the central station servers will say, hey, wait a minute. It's been 24 or 25 hours. We have not gotten our daily check-in from that system. They call that a daily test failure or a no timer test. Something's wrong and, uh, you know, we got to go check it out. Many of these panels are still using phone lines, plain old phone lines to dial in, like, you know, the old AOL days or whatever. Some panels have two phone lines just to make sure in case for redundancy or whatever. Again, depending on how they set it up, you might be getting trouble signals related to the phone lines. The newer panels are more frequently using uh, newer technologies like the internet um, to connect in. They dial it in over the internet or they have internet with like a phone backup or something like that. Um, Some can even use radios. Uh, They use a mesh radio system um, and uh, many municipalities require a number of radio enabled panels in the area to make sure that, you know, if you just have one radio panel out in the middle of nowhere with no mesh connectivity to other panels, um, then that, that might be a bad thing. So some municipalities have specific regulations on what panels are allowed to connect by a radio and you know, whatever, what panels are allowed to connect by the internet, do they have to have a phone line backup and, and all kinds of things. And that's gonna depend on your local, you know, your local fire code or, or whatever the regulations are in your area. Okay, so we discussed information regarding detailed, detailed the details on, uh, uh, excuse me, we discussed, we discussed asking the alarm companies for detailed information on alarm signals when they come in. Uh, uh, one thing that we really do have to be very concerned about is if there's flood systems or other sort of hazardous suppression systems that might be at the site. And if so, we gotta make sure that all responders, fire, police, and anybody else who's going to the scene, we gotta make sure they're, they're aware that those systems are there, especially if they've gone off or if we suspect they've gone off already, uh, we wanna make sure that they know that those are there so that in case it does go off or it has gone off, they don't get trapped in one of those rooms. Um, And they also know that there might be people who have to be, you know, civilians who have to be evacuated out of those areas. So we wanna make sure they're aware of that. Any other information that we get from the alarm company when they're they're calling it in or when we're getting it by a direct connect on our panel. I hope you enjoyed this information about automatic fire alarms. I want to thank some of the uh, agencies that contributed to the videos to this to this particular demonstration, to this particular presentation. The Home Fire Sprinkler Coalition is a is an advocacy group that's working to encourage people to get fire sprinklers in their home. You can check them out online. Just Google it. Other than that, there's my contact information up there again on the screen. <clears throat> Excuse me.
Again, if you have questions, comments, feedback, corrections, or anything else like that that I missed, please don't hesitate to drop me a line. Other than that, I look forward to seeing you again soon on one of our future webinars. Stay safe.